Hallelujah. Thank you so much, choir. God bless you richly. Glory to God. And so tonight, I want to briefly begin my introduction. God's servant by the Spirit has asked that we consider a very sensitive subject and I believe it is pertinent at this time that the body of Christ comes to that level of awakening. Christianity, the quality and the strength of Christianity as it ought to be is not what we see today. We have reduced the essence of Christianity to thank you, a means of just um, attending to our basic needs, daily needs. Whereas God, what God has in mind is bigger than the very little, little needs that we have for our daily runnings. When you begin to deal with the human entity, you discover that his needs are in cadres. There are the existential needs that begins from the externalities, like security, like food, like clothing. These things are very important. We are not trying to undermine them. But you see, they also go to define the level of your existence, the cadre of your existence. You have people who operate at a level today where their needs are just basically what to eat. So their primary need is hunger and clothing. But that's the lowest level of existence. If all your needs are hung, are, are, has to do with hunger and clothing, you are the lowest level of life. Because when you graduate from there, you come to the place of security. Now, a man who needs food does not bother about security. That's why you see beggars sleeping on the streets. Because so long as you don't have what to eat, security is not important. But the moment you have what to eat and what to wear, security becomes important. So you migrate from food and clothing to the necessity, the need for security. Now, when you have security, then you now go to another level where your feelings becomes important. You now become concerned about who likes you and who hates you. The guy who doesn't have security does not care about who likes him or who hates him. But the moment you become secure, who likes you, who hates you become a factor. And then when you grow to that level, you now migrate further to the place of self-esteem. Your self-value, your self-respect becomes a concern. And so when you are treated wrongly, you won't take it. And that's because you have grown beyond food and, and, and shelter. You have grown beyond security. You have grown beyond emotional needs. Now you are concerned about self-esteem. And then you go to self-actualization. These are psychological realities. And we can't deny them. But you see, if we, all, if we live only at that level of existence, it means we are useless as far as eternity is concerned. And so the things we want to deal with in this conference are beyond the ephemeralities of life. They are beyond clothing, food, security. They are beyond matters of self-esteem, self-actualization. We are looking at what is in the heart of the Father. Because when you get what's in the heart of the Father, all of these things will be byproducts. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and he said all these things that men seek he doesn't undermine them they are very important he said but men seek those things he said if we seek the kingdom of god and his righteousness he said these things will be added to us when you start fulfilling god's agenda for your life you will discover that all of the other things that constitutes the pursuit of men becomes an addition to your life and so in this, in this conference, we are, we are considering one of the things that is very important to God, and that is territories. And when we talk territories, we are not just talking about geographical location. 
when we talk territories, we are talking about the governing influence of a king over a people, creating a civilization that mirrors his intent. So it's not just about geography. It's about the predominant influence over a people, the culture that is created on account of that influence, and the extent to which these people live only to, to fulfill the, the desires of that king. That's what we are looking at. That at the time we are done with this conference, not just those who are here, but every other person who makes contact with us will come under the influence and the government of God. And they will begin to live to please his will. And we trust that as that begins to happen on a larger scale, everywhere they are, they will insist that the operational modalities in those regions also aligns with God's intent, with God's culture, and with God's ways. This is what this conference is about. And this is one of the obsessions of spirits. And until men begin to live to satisfy this obsession, their life will be useless. In my study of the scripture, I've come to realize that three things define the value of a man's existence. The first is the degree to which you know God. Because man was created with a vacuum in the soul. It is his knowledge of spirits that brings him into fulfillment. If you don't have a relationship with a spirit, you will discover nothing you get will satisfy you. You will pursue it until you lay hold on it. And the moment you get it, you discover that it can satisfy you because your, your desires are deeper than anything that is physical. And you can experiment it. You can think through it here. Everything you've pursued, the moment you got it, it became nothing. That's how life is. So what really gives meaning to your existence is your knowledge of spirits and the spirit of God in particular. So Jesus speaking in John 17 verse 3, he said, this is life eternal. He said that you may know him, the only true God and him whom he has sent. So if you don't know God, at the end of your life, at the end of your sojourn on the face of the earth, you will discover you will never have fulfillment. And you will cross into eternity, live that life of depravity forever and ever. The second thing that gives value and relevance to our existence is the degree to which we can worship God. And worship in this context is not a song. Worship in this context is your alignment with God's will so that the glory of God in your spirit can be ventilated, can be released back to him. That's why the first time worship was mentioned in scripture was in Genesis 22 verse 5. Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac and he said, I'm going up to worship. There was no singing there. There was obedience. There was alignment to the will of God. And as you walk through life, you will discover that every day there are decisions you have to make. And these decisions are either in, in, in compliance to God's will or in rebellion to God's will. Your ability to consistently choose to align to God's will is an act of worship in the realms of God. And that is what will give value to your existence. If you live your life and you don't choose God's choices, you will discover that at the end of time, you will be irrelevant as far as the equation of eternity is concerned. And so the first thing that gives relevance to our existence is our experience or knowledge of God. The second thing that gives relevance to our existence is the degree to which we worship God. Jesus was speaking in John 4, 24. He said, the Father is seeking for a particular kind of people. And he said, those are those who worship him in spirit and in truth. The third thing that gives you relevance as far as existence is concerned is the degree to which you participate in advancing God's agenda. And that is what this conference is about. To teach us and to empower us to co collaborate with the Holy Spirit and God's people to advance God's agenda in the region of the United Kingdom and beyond. So we are hoping that people will not just encounter God in this conference. We are hoping that people will not just come to a place of total submission to choose only God's will going forward. We are hoping that people will submit to God's corporate agenda and become active participants in that agenda so that anywhere they are, only the influence of God finding expression is their pursuit. Because these three things is what defines our existence. But the truth is, these things are not gotten cheaply. When you make up your mind to live like this, you will discover you will come into warfare. 
Because there are many spirits in the realm that don't want you to live like this. You can be anything you want to be, but to know God, but to worship God, but to advance God's kingdom. The moment you make up your mind that from today I want to know God, I want to worship God, and I want to advance God's kingdom, you will be, you will be amazed the entities in the realm that will rise up to negate that desire that you have made. This is why we must be taught the biblical principles and secrets that gives us the edge required to do that which the devil does not want us to do. And that's what this conference is about. And so for territorial takeover, which is one of God's chiefest agenda on the face of the earth, there are a few things I want to introduce us to tonight very quickly. Number one, I want to show us the nature of the spirit realm. Tomorrow I will preach. There will be revival. But <laughs> let me lay foundation so that when fire falls, there will be foundation. Let's be sure that we know. Because <laughs> in recent times, I've discovered that a lot of people are on fire, but there's no purpose to it. <laughs> and fire is not just to, to, to scream and shout in church. Every time you're on fire, God has an agenda. So if there's no purpose to the flame, the flame will quench. So we'll take tonight to look at a few things, sensitive matter. And so the first thing I want to do tonight is to show us the nature of territories. Then the second thing I'll do tonight is to show us the entities that rule over territories. So that you understand not just jurisdiction, but you also understand authorities as far as territorial issues are concerned. Because civilization is actually the reflection of the nature of spirits. When you come into a territory and you see a particular kind of civilization or a lifestyle, that's the nature of that spirit. Because a spirit superimposes its nature on a people and it becomes their culture. So when you touch the texture of the culture, you have touched the nature of that spirit. And for you to be able to deculturate a territory, you will know that you need a lot of battle because you have to expel the spirit that superimposes this culture on the people. That's why any time you say thy kingdom come is a declaration of war. A spirit is about to be dethroned and that spirit will fight. Glory to God. So we we'll look at the nature of territories, we we'll look at the princes, the rulers over territories, and then we we'll look at instrument for territorial governance so that you know the instruments or the tools that spirits use to dominate territories. And so when you go to take over territories, you know what you are fighting against. Because there are, these, these are matters of spiritual intelligence. Nothing happening in the territory is haphazard. It is well designed with very specific intelligence. And if you know the tools spirits are using, you will know how to disarm them. If you don't know the tools they are using, you will punch the wind. You will punch the air and you will achieve no results. Number four, we now look at the agents that God raises for deliverance. Because not everybody can be part of God's agency for orchestrating deliverance in the territory. You may be passionate about it, it doesn't mean you can. You know, no matter what happens in the UK today, even if a thousand children go to the street and start crying, it's not a protest. They will come quickly to rescue them <laughs> because they are children. But if 50 men step out, you know adults are talking. And in this kingdom, there's a difference between a child and a son. We have too many children of God. That's one of the undoing of the church. We don't have sons of God. Governance is a function or a responsibility of sons, not children. And so we need to understand those who are raised or who become agents of kingdom advancement. And then finally, we'll look at the instrument we must deploy if we must take over territories. So these are five things I want us to look at very quickly tonight. Number one, the nature of territories. Number two, the rulers or the princes that govern territories. Number three, the instruments they use to dominate territories. Number four, the agents of deliverance that God raises for territories. And number five, the instruments we must use to create emancipation in territories. So let's look at the nature of territories. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. I want you to write these scriptures down. Go and study them later. God will breathe upon these scriptures 
to give you deeper understanding. He said, but ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. I will stop there. Now, the people this scripture is written to, they are not in heaven. They were on earth. They were in a physical geography on earth. But when this scripture was written to them, it was written in the present tense. It said, you are come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. How can somebody be on earth in a location? You are telling the person, no, you are in Mount Zion, the city of the living God. It gives you an idea of how we walk and function in this life. Everybody part-time operates in a dual geography. You are in a physical geography and you are in a spiritual geography at the same time. The outcome of your life is a function of the dimension that rules or dominates your consciousness. And so if you are on earth but your consciousness is of the reality of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, you will function on earth like an agent of heaven. But if you are on earth and your consciousness is not dominated by the new Jerusalem, you will function like the citizen of earth. That is why most of us in the UK today, football is our God. Because we are aware of what is happening around. The problem is not the football. The challenge is the things that football can smuggle into your soul. Because when you become too addicted, every other thing that comes with it can now enter your soul. So it can become a corridor for accessing your soul. And that's how spirits function. There's an intelligence. If the heavenly Jerusalem is the only city in the spirit, there wouldn't have been a problem. The challenge is that there are many other spirit cities. The heavenly Jerusalem is not the only city in the spirit. If you begin to study your Bible, Isaiah 19, for, for instance, if you study from verse 1 to 8, you are going to discover that Egypt is not just a physical geography. Egypt is also a spiritual geography. The same way you have the physical Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem, you have the physical Egypt and the spiritual Egypt. And Egypt is not the only city. There is also a city called Babylon. There are many cities in the spirit realm. And the goal of this city is to dominate men and to give them a culture and a life in light. And it also happens in darkness. And so when a man does not understand how to align with a spirit city, he will not have authority in his physical territory. So if we want to begin to talk about territory takeover, the first question we must ask is, where is our original citizenship? If our citizenship is not in the heavenly Jerusalem, if we don't function like ambassadors of the heavenly Jerusalem, we can't take it. Because it will be dominated by the city that rule over it. This is where the first crisis begins from. I was teaching around this subject some days ago in Kaduna, and I told them, imagine a man like Caleb, who could take a mountain at 80. He was in Egypt, and he didn't conquer any mountain. The potential was there, but the city called Egypt dominated it. Imagine a man like Joshua who could conquer 31 kingdoms. Joshua was in Egypt like an errand boy. None of those potentials found expression because Egypt subdued him. A woman like Miriam who could prophesy and sing songs of heaven. None of those prophetic strings flowed so long as he was in Egypt. Until she came out of Egypt, the potential was useless. So if you have not come into a city in the spirit, you cannot win any city on earth. Most of us are in England and we don't know the cities that rule here. If you want to take over this physical territory so that revival can find expression, you must be able, through spiritual wisdom, look upon the landscape and discern which cities in the spirit are controlling this realm. Because there are different laws for fighting different spirits. Egypt brings slavery. If you want to fight Egypt, you need a rod. It's the rod of God. It's authority that destroys Egypt. Egypt is not open to negotiation. No matter how you negotiate, Pharaoh won't let you go. 
you must come with power. And so if Egypt is dominating people and you are coming with intelligence, you will waste your time. Because Moses tried it. When he started negotiating, he said, who is your God? Here we don't talk. We show power. And when Moses descended, Moses dropped his rod. They dropped theirs. When Moses' rod swallowed their own, they now say, okay, he's saying something. So <laughs> the language Egypt understands is power. Now, you, you, you are looking at a territory that Egypt is dominating people. You see people enslaved to all kinds of things. They, they, are, they are living error with pride. And you think you can come and start talking. The, the issue is not a debate. Oh. It's a rod of power you need. Because no matter how eloquent you are, eloquence has no place in the courts of Pharaoh. You need to come with a rod. And so when Moses speaks, the moment he turns back, Pharaoh's heart to become hardened. He will say, okay, tomorrow. And every tomorrow, either darkness comes, or frogs comes, or water turns to blood. Until the last time, all the firstborn children, sons, were wiped out. At that point, Pharaoh broke. And they left. Pharaoh rose up and started chasing again. So they had to be, to, to be wiped out in the Red Sea. So you, you need to understand the city you are fighting. The first question I'll ask us is, what are the spirit cities ruling people in the UK? What have you discerned? That's why taking over city is a matter of intelligence in the spirit. You look at people, they wake up, somebody wants to marry his gender. You think it's biology he needs? <laughs> you think it's sociology? This is not sociology, this is not biology. A force is perverting people. That is Babylon. Because Babylon is mixture. Babylon is corruption. People wake up suddenly, their emotions are perverted. And in that perversion, they are becoming great and great. You know that this is a city at work. The question is, how do you conquer Babylon? Because Babylon has two operational modalities. Invention and greatness, and then compromise and perversion. That's how Babylon works. So, so long as you, you can compromise and work in perversion, you will be great. Now, you come... You are doing counseling session. You bring a psychologist. You want to advise the person. If you do this, after five years, you will regret it. That thing you are saying means nothing. It's Babylon that is at work. And for you to conquer Babylon, you must come by a superior wisdom from heaven. And it will take prophetic intelligence and unending priesthood. How many of us can pray for 21 days? How many of us can stay on the altar? And say we will not go. And 21 days in this context is not 21. It means having the stamina to stay on the altar and say I won't leave here until God speaks. I won't leave here until there is an encounter. Because when Daniel went to the altar, he didn't move until the message came from heaven. That was when he stood up. Is it this generation that go to altar and say, Father, we love you. Thank you so much. And sleep. That can conquer Babylon. <laughs> When we have 100,000 seminars, it will not affect nothing. Because for you to war against Babylon, you need stamina. So when you see things happening in your territory, you need to understand where the people are living. That means people are living in the UK and they're also living in Babylon. People are living in the UK and they're also living in Egypt. So the first thing you must understand is the cities where they are domiciled. Because everybody has two passports. One is a physical passport. The other is a spiritual passport. You cannot begin to talk to them except as you can fight the city that is ruling them. That's the first thing we need to understand. Territories have impact on the lifestyle of people. Most people in the UK are Babylonians. That's why perversion is the order of the day. That's why you see the things you see happening. It is a system. It is a system. It is a system. It will take either superior priesthood intelligence or judgment. Because when Sodom wouldn't repent, fire came down. So you need to begin to trust God to bring certain dimension of judgment that will bring terror, terror to the heart of the people. But those kinds of things, they don't happen cheaply. They take different levels of engagement in the spirit. That's the first level of this conversation spirit cities you need to understand the geographies that people are domiciling the second thing is the rulers that function in territories 
How do they operate? I didn't know this one until we started traveling from city to city. And then we started planting centers. When we started entering cities and planting centers, a wave of attack hit us from nowhere. I said, what is going on here? As in, several people attacked at the same time. That was when I saw the violence of darkness. Because we entered those territories, we wanted to uproot the government and plant new institutions. And Satan came for us violently. That was when I knew that spiritual engagements are in different levels. When you enter a city, every city you see has a Lord. If you study this scripture that we read from Hebrews 12, you will see that the Bible recognizes God there as the judge of all. So every city has their rulers. God was called the judge of all there. If you go to Egypt, there are gods in Egypt. Exodus 12 verse 12, he said, Tonight I will pass through Egypt and I will judge the gods of Egypt. So these things are not just engagements in the court of Pharaoh alone. They are battles of princes in the heavenlies. If you study Daniel chapter 10, verse 20 and 21, after Daniel prayed and the angel came to him, the angel told him, the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days until Michael was deployed to assist me. That is why I came. And I came to give you skill and understanding. I'm going back to war. Because there are rulers responsible for every spirit city that tries to enslave men. And so you need to also understand that this matter is a matter that requires participation in the heavenlies. When we begin to talk about territories, it will, it's, it's a reality that is beyond our faith. That's why you can't just come and say, I decree and declare, London, be free. If it's cancer, you can do that. If it's high blood pressure, you can do that. But you can't come and say, I decree and declare, Liverpool, in the mighty name of Jesus, be free. No, it doesn't happen like that. There are gods there. When you begin to engage princes, Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So you see that it's a league of gods. The word principality is the word arche. It means the first in rank. So when spirits want to begin to bring their government, because it's also a colonization strategy. People in the UK did not just wake up overnight and started advocating for what they're advocating. You know what I'm talking about. Since, since we're in the church, let me be careful. If it was an apostolic invasion, I would have spoken. Because that one, when we finish, all of us will go. If you come, you see an empty <laughs> People didn't just wake up and started advocating. No. There was a reference point in history when it started. That was when that civilization came. There was a time when functionaries brought that intelligence to men. And this is how these guys function. When they want to bring the influence of a city, principalities are the ones that go first. And the way principalities work is that they are negotiators. When they come into the territory, they identify the physical functionaries that are there. I'm showing you why this thing is an intelligent warfare. Because the heavens belong to God. The act he has given to the sons of men. So Babylon can't just enter a nation. No. There are people who open the door. Egypt cannot just enter a society. There are people who cooperated with their will to open the door. So when principalities show up, what they do is that first of all, they identify the stakeholders in the territory. Because not everybody can even do kingdom business. You know, there are some negotiations now that your, the country goes into. It is done and concluded in the parliament. You just hear it on the news. Whether you like it or not, it's not a factor. They will just tell you now they have changed immigration law. <laughs> because it's officials that enter negotiation. So what principalities do is that they come into the territory and they look for stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? They are the people that have a priesthood in the spirit. 
people who are already engaging in the realm. So they begin to negotiate with them. For instance, as we are sitting here now, maybe seven people are prophetic. Since they came into this meeting, they've seen visions. Not every of us have seen vision. Some of us have not even seen one since this year began. Because we don't have those horns. But there are some that in this service alone, they've seen three visions. They are prophetic. You know the challenge with the prophetic people is that their emotional threshold is high. Because they need that oil to flow through their emotion. So when the principality comes here, he looks for the person who is prophetic and he begins to tempt him with seduction. That same prophetic person, if he's a male, he may have noticed three ladies already that walked in. You will not even know what is happening. And he will go back and say, Kai, the temptation is difficult. This, the temptation now is that. Now you are wondering, what temptation is that? The principality is using the threshold of his emotion. The same thing that helps him to see into the spirit. The principality is trying to pervert it by turning his attention to the direction of emotion. If that guy's priesthood is not strong and he allows himself to be lured, what will happen is that he would have been recruited. A point will now come, they will use him as part of the doorway into the city. Because anywhere that man prophesies, he's releasing the energy of that spirit that is also... Because that seduction is not emotion, it's not sin, it's not just a sin, it's also an act of worship. Every time you commit immorality, you are worshipping the spirit. Because praise and worship is not just God, you are good. That's why I began by telling you, worship is alignment to the will of his spirit. So if you are prophetic and you allow your emotions to be affected and you get into immorality, every time you commit that immorality, as you stand on the stage to prophesy, you are releasing seductive energy into the spirit. Those who are apostolic are people of authority. You see that your faith level is so strong. When these spirits come, they will suggest things to you. Is it this church that they can be sending you up and down? Come on, get out. How can they be talking to you like that? Because they know that the grace you carry is one that releases a lot of energy and power. So it makes you function almost like a military person. It's an apostolic spirit. They will build arrogance, build ego, build pride into you. If you allow that pride to dominate you, you will now notice that when you are talking, you are not talking what God is saying. You are talking from pride. pride. The more you release that energy, the more you create an atmosphere. So when the principality succeeds in saturating the environment, then the powers will come. The word powers is the word exousia. Their job is to make people become slaves of the systems that have been created. So you now discover that because the prophet slept with three people, immorality becomes part of the church. You now come, you hear that, oh, the choir leader has slept with four people. And before you know, he enters the society. And the more people become enslaved, a point will even come, you will discover that immorality becomes part of the culture. Cohabiting is normal. So when you like somebody, he moves in. You, you say, where's your girlfriend? He has moved in. <laughs> yeah, she has not moved in. Both of you are living in immorality. Forget the modern names we give it. You have not moved in. You are in immorality. You now discover that thing that began with one, two, three, five prophets is now the culture. And so long as people keep moving in, the powers will be there and they will be strong. And when the powers finish, then the rulers come. The word rulers of darkness is cosmocratus. Their job is that they are lawgivers. When it gets to the level where rulers come, hmm, at that time it has become the people's culture. That's why today even marriage is a show. People have been living together for seven years. They now say, hey, why not get married? They go to a poolside. They just do a... a, a <laughs> the whole church service is a show. And, and it doesn't mean anything. After two, three weeks, three months, I'm tired, man. This is not working. And they go. <laughs> you are tired. It's not working. It has become a culture. What you are seeing there is the signature of a ruler. And so long as those cultures continue, that territory will be in darkness. Then the point comes, then the spiritual wickedness shows up. They are called cosmo. Those ones are called poneria. They are the ones who bring sickness, death corruption, evil. Because that's where de the devil judges men. So when we talk about territorial takeover, 
is a system that will undo the protocol that principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness have created. So a territory has not yet been taken except cohabiting stop. Except I love this person and you have the same sex, stop. Except as corruption stops because all of those things are the things that give those princes power. That's why when we stand and we declare, we, we, we take over, they are just looking at us. Do you know what you are saying? <laughs> we, took, we took 15 years to build this system. We took 20 years to build this system. Do you, are, you, are you ready for it? It's a serious business. And that is why it's not something that anybody can just come and say, we will take. No. Because if you win, if you know it, what you are saying, it may take your whole lifetime. Some of us, prayer. Some of us, evangelizing. Some of us, going into government to write new policies. To stop the old policies that created room. So it's not a five-day thing. So when we are talking territory takeover, we will not even look at the territory first. We will look at the men. Because you need to raise men who have the capacity to take territories. Because it's a complex spiritual algorithm that has been weaved. It has become a culture. And it is when it became a culture that the princes sat down that they have done their job. We will have to deculturate them. So you need to know that there are spiritual cities and you need to know that there are spiritual entities. And these beings, you don't cast them out. They are not demons. They are fallen angels. That's why Paul didn't say cast out principalities and power. He said we wrestle with them. We wrestle. But if you have not even built capacity to do five days prayer, how, how can you fight a battle that will take five years? Because if we are talking territory takeover, we will need some people on the altar for 10 years. But the Christianity we have built is not even a Christianity where people think prayer is necessary. They only pray when they want to travel or when they, they need a contract. They only pray when... So that, that means the, the architecture we have now is not built to take cities. If we want to take cities, we need to raise new set of Christians. And these ones will not be children, they will be sons. Because when you become a son, you begin to think about the agenda of God. And so you will dedicate your life to fulfilling that agenda. For some of us, we will strive to become members of parliament. Not because we need the title of a senator. But for the 15 years that will be there, we will fight until we change one policy. It may not be many, one. But that one policy you have changed, you are a warrior. It will preserve a generation for 50 years. Some of us will become intercessors. And because we are intercessors, we will pray for 15 years. And the whole prayer is for United Kingdom to be delivered. Nobody may know you. Because it's not about who, who, who is the popular preacher. When we are talking kingdom and territory takeover, popularity is not a gift. It's a burden. You may be on the altar for 15 years crying. Because the prayer you are praying is what will encourage the politician. So you are generating fuel. And then some of us, God will give us skill to make money. But the money we are making is not so that we can build houses for ourselves. Now, there's nothing wrong in having houses. You can build as much as you want. But the money you are making is to sponsor kingdom agenda. So when somebody is pursuing a bill, how much, what do you need? You support. If somebody is praying, don't worry. Food is not pray, it's not a, From today, don't pray for food. You provide food. So you, you are like the equalizer, equilibrator of what is going on. You support the one who is in government. You support the one who is on the altar. You now discover that we must also build a system if we will counter the one in darkness. But this Christianity of selfish and self-centered people, how can we achieve it? The guy who needs to pray can't pray because he has desire to, to, for, for self-preservation. He has desire for self-aggrandizement. The one God has given money thinks he has become the God among men. Everybody should lie down to greet him. Meanwhile, you are providing money. Another one is providing prayer. Another one is providing policy. All of us are the same. We just have different weapons. But if we are not sons, we will not know. So the guy who has money thinks it's important. And today, even when we come to church, we think prayer is for the poor. We don't know that we are in different departments. The read department is not choir. The read department is in the spirit. Based on what God gave us, some have resources to sponsor kingdom Others have prayer to push kingdom. Others have voices to preach the burden of God. It is that corporate functioning that
that creates a quorum for territory takeover. So you must understand the nature of territories. You must understand the princes that rule territory. Then you must understand the kind of weapons they use. Now, let me show you their weapons. I give you five weapons quickly. Number one, ignorance. And when I say ignorance, I mean spiritual ignorance. Psalm 82, from verse 5 to 6, he said, They know not, neither will they understand. He said, They walk on in darkness. He said, I, I have said. He said, They walk on in darkness. Go back. He said, Now, see, see the impact. See, see the connection between ignorance and territory. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Because they are walking in darkness, see what happened. All the foundation of the earth is out of course. So the devil knows that our darkness affects the territory. People just wake up, they say they want to do what they want. And they don't know that I want to do what I want has an impact on the land. He said, I have said, ye are gods because you are the children of the most high. He said, but you fall like one of the princes. Why? Because they know not. And this is why 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, the Bible said, if our gospel be hid, he said it is hid to those who are lost. So this kind of ignorance is not that I'm not reading book. They can't get it. Their minds are blinded. That's why you meet somebody, you tell him this thing you are doing is wrong. He can't see it. Too. He's not trying to. He's not, somebody says he's a satanist. He dresses in a particular way, tears himself, puts all kinds of matters. You are trying to help the person. The person can't see it. You will even be offended. Why can't you get it? It's because he's ignorant. As far as he's concerned, what he's doing is the best thing to do. He's seeing you as ignorant. It's just like trying to advise a madman. The madman thinks you are very mad. <laughs> so when princes are taking territories, they blind people. They blind people and those blindness makes them to violate God's ordinance. So it's not just a common blindness. It's a blindness that makes people violate God's ordinance. Do you know some people don't see anything wrong in having intimate relationship outside marriage? I love him. So what do you mean? What, 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 what is... They don't care as far... And they are not trying to be arrogant. They don't see anything wrong that two mature people love themselves. Why can't they live together? Some people don't see anything wrong loving people of the same sex. As far as they are concerned, so long as we love them, we do what we want. And there's nothing you can tell them that they will accept. When the devil wants to take a territory, he sends ignorance as a weapon. And the arrow of ignorance can put people in bondage. This is why we preach the gospel the way we preach it. So that in case they refuse, it will be written against them as a testimony that they heard. That way, God will be just when he judges. But if we don't preach, we will be part of the iniquity. So if you see these things happen and you don't preach, you are part. He said, if I tell a wicked man, you will die. And you don't tell him. He said, I will demand his blood of your hand. He said, if you tell him and he chooses to remain in wickedness, he will die and you'll be free. When Paul preached the gospel and they rejected it, he said, now I'm free from your blood. Because there must be a witness against this oppression of darkness. Ignorance. Number two is lost. When the devil wants to enslave people, he makes their emotion their God. So people no longer heed the voice of truth and reason. So long as they like it, they will do it. Lost. If you read the book of Judges, you see it replete. Every generation that you, they take action and you ask them and they say they like it, they love it, and that's the only justification for taking that action. No, that generation is doomed. Because it's a strategy of the devil. We don't take action because we like it. We take action because the word of God approves it. And in case we don't like it and God approves it, we'll still do what God wants and put our emotions aside. That's a generation going somewhere. Glory to God. The third weapon Satan uses is terror. He puts his terror and dread on a people. There are some people who are so afraid of doing the right thing. 
Even they don't know why. Have you not seen people being molested? They are tired, but they are afraid of stepping out. They can't even say it. And you ask them, what are you afraid of? They don't know. It's terror. Spirits use it as a weapon. Even God uses terror. In Deuteronomy 2, 24 and 25, he said, rise up. Take up your journey. Go beyond the river Anon. He said, I have given unto you, see on the Amorite king of Heshbon. Begin to dominate him and possess the land. In verse 25, he said, I have put my dread upon you. He said, when the nations see you, they paralyze. So it's a system spirits use. They put terror on the people. And so they are afraid. And that's why every time Satan, look at the Middle, the, the Middle East and all of some of those nations. You see a lot of terror. People are afraid of speaking out. If you dare say you don't like it, you are finished. So people just continue in slavery because of fear. And one of the weapons Satan is using in the world today is terrorism. Because terror puts people in bondage. Number five, they are policies. Policies released from thrones. If you think position of authority is not spirituality, think a second time. There are certain policies that if they are approved, will pray for 10 years before they are changed. Something that was just signed, it will take 10 years of intercession to change it. This is why God is interested in putting men in places of power. Because thrones are highly spiritual. No Christianity should discourage you from doing politics. We need a lot of people in government because there are certain things we change by praying, other things we change by policies. And if we don't have people there to make those policies, they, make, they will make others for us and will be under captivity for a long time. In fact, one of the things that enslave people the most, if you study the Bible, is policies. Look at the book of Daniel chapter 6. They just went to the king and, and told him, let nobody pray to any other God. How does that affect the nation? Because they wanted to set Daniel up. And the king signed it. And because of that policy, they threw Daniel to the lion's den. Look at the days of Esther. They went to the king and, and told the king to sign a law to destroy all the Jews. Why? Say they are multiplying in this land and they are against your government. So you wipe out the whole race. Policies. Satan uses it to destroy people. Those of us from Africa, at least we still have some leverage. We can preach what we want for now. <laughs> Those of you in the Western world, some of the things we say, you can't say it. Because they are policies. If you say it, there will be crisis. And if I say something before they know I said it, I will run back to Africa. <laughs> but these are weapons. Weapons that Satan uses. Ignorance, lust, terror, policies and laws. If we want to take over territories, we must have a system that counters ignorance. That's why matters of territorial takeover is not just zeal. It is a very deliberate, well-tailored, and highly orchestrated strategy of takeover. We must have a structured system for countering ignorance. What, 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 what is the intelligence we have for all of the ignorance that we see people practice in our society? The church, you know, in the early church, they sat down. People just shout. And most of the things we say is not even logically correct. To, 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 to even for the people to even absorb and so when you talk they say forget all those fanatics so what we are saying must be intelligent spiritually intelligent and backed up with power because there is an ignorance that the devil has released upon the people and then we must come with fire like God's servant said because there is a lust in people's soul that we must burn off so that they can have a new obsession for God we must also come with a lot of boldness and courage to, to be able to paralyze terror because many people are afraid because of the terror that the devil sends into the souls of men and then we must have people in authority to write laws that can counter whatever the devil is planning so this is the third aspect of territorial takeover they are the instruments that satan uses so number one you need to understand how territories work there is a spiritual city over every physical city. And everybody you see is walking in both cities. The one that dominates him is the one that forms his character. 
and then there are princes that write laws from the spiritual cities to dominate the citizens of the physical city so when people come under the laws of those spirits there's nothing you can do except as you disarm those spirits no matter how you advise the people you can't help them many people are taking drugs today not because they love it it's a law written for people of particular age bracket and if you come to that age bracket you discover that those appetites will wake up and that's why they are doing those things to destroy them you must be able to contend with the spirit that is giving them that deception otherwise you can't help them so you understand that then you now look at the weapons they are using and then you create a weapon that will counter it now when you understand these three then you come to the fourth level which is the agents that have the stature to fight this battle it's not everybody that's why it's good to win souls but if we stop there we can't affect our world even the ones who win will go back when we have one souls, we must disciple them people must grow from being children of God to becoming sons of God who is a child of God a child of God is one who believes that Jesus is Lord and on account of that belief receives eternal life everyone who has the life of God becomes a child of God glory to God in 1st John 5 11 he said this is the record he said God has given us eternal life he said whoever has the son has life he said these things have written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know that you have eternal life so anybody who has Jesus has life and if you have life you are a child of God but that is where you begin from for you to be part of kingdom advancement to be able to create weapons that can counter the weapons of darkness from ignorance to loss to terror to policies and for you to be able to wrestle against principalities powers rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness you can't be a child you must grow first to becoming a son who is a son there are four definitions for sons in the new testament context number one a son is one who reveals god who mirrors god if you have not come to a point where your Christianity is such that people can see God in you, you are not yet a son. In Hebrews chapter 1, from verse 1 to 3, it says, God who had sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in this last day spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, Jesus was speaking in John 14. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's the Son. And every apostle that God used to advance kingdom in their generation matured to this level. Paul was speaking in 1 Corinthians 11. 1. He said, be a followers of me as I'm the follower of Christ. That means if you encounter me, it's as good as you have encountered Christ. John was speaking in 1 John 4, 17. He said, as he is. He says, so are we, not in heaven, in this world. And it was not meant for the apostles. This is supposed to be the training manual for Christians. Because when God gave the fivefold, he gave the fivefold so that they can train the believers to come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 14, to 16. He said, when we all come into the fullness, we should come into him in all fullness, even Christ, the head of the church. So every Christian is expected to grow to a level where if you meet them, you have met God. And that's why Paul said, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. So Christianity is not about filling church auditoriums. Christianity is about raising people to grow to be able to mirror God. And so our activities should not be activities that excite us. Our activities should be activities that provoke transfiguration. That's why a church of acting dramas can't raise mature Christians. Church shouldn't be all about excitement, excitement. There's a place of praising God. But we are not dancing here to, to satisfy our emotion. Everything we do must have an objective. And the objective is to make people become like God. If we are preaching the word of God, the goal is to make people become like God. If we are praying, the goal is to make people become like God. So those who are in leadership must be able to fine-tune the focus of the believers to make them know that the major objective is for them to become like God. 
In Africa today, there's a massive prayer movement. And the whole idea behind prayer now is I can pray long. And when I'm praying, people must see me. And it has become Phariseeism. Because it's the Pharisees that take pride in praying long. Praying long is very important. It will drill you. But if it's about people seeing you that you pray long and you start by street, street corners and make boast, you are a Pharisee. And that's why people are praying now. They are not being transformed. But when you pray, you are supposed to see. They say, ask of me, I will answer. Jeremiah 33 verse 3. I will show you great and mighty things. And when you see, you are transformed. We all with open faces, beholding us in the glass. The glory of the Lord, we are changed. How come people are praying now? They are not being changed. Because there are no leaders to teach them what to focus on. So they are focused on things that puff the flesh and not things that transform them to become like Christ. Meanwhile, the fathers of old prayed and when they came out of the mountain, you saw God. There were people who came out from the place of prayer and their faces were glowing. When Moses descended from the mountains of Sinai, is the Bible said he wished not that his face was shining. They had to cover him with veils. They prayed and they manifested God. Even Jesus, the Bible said in Matthew 17 verse 2 and 3, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His real men began to glister. So the goal is to transfigure us until we become like so. So when we gather in church, church should become like a constituency where people carry different dimensions of God. You say the ones by the right, they are healers. The ones by the left, they are voices. When you want to know what God is saying, go to the left. Anybody can tell you what God is saying. Because that's like a company of prophets. The sons of Isaac, they said they had understanding. It wasn't a prophet in Isaac. No, they had migrated from individuals. It has become a heritage of a people. The sons of Isaac, they said they had understanding of times and seasons. So what they caught in God was the voice of God. Everyone resembled God's voice. That's what we should do. And that's the sign that a church is becoming territorial. A church is not territorial because it has an auditorium that seats 40,000. All the thieves in society can come and hide there. I'm telling you. People, do you know thieves hide in church? Because when they are there, can't find them. Say it's a deacon. And deacon is a senator. The whole money for the constituency, he has used it to buy Rolls Royce. And that is deacon. That means, Jesus said it. I'm not the one who said it. He said, this is a den of thieves. He wasn't talking in the market. He was talking in church. He came to church. He said, this is a den of thieves. He said, meanwhile, my house should be a house of prayer. It should be a house of encounters. It should be a house where people are transfigured into God. He said, when we see him, we shall be like him. So if we are not being like him, it's because we are not seeing him. And there's a technology for seeing him. If the word is preached, if Christ is preached, people will become like God. And if people pray correctly, they will be like God. But our focus is not to raise souls. And that's why, although we are many, we are not territorial. You will be shocked that a church of 20 may be more territorial than a church of 30,000. Because it's not the number that makes the church territorial. It's the sons. How many sons are there? And men become sons when they reveal God. If they talk, they reveal God. Their character reveals God. And when such men rise, territories will be taken. Because anything that comes out of them is a strategy. A strategy for countering what Satan is doing in the territory. Number two thing that makes sons is the ability to be led by the voice of God. Romans 8.14, it said, as many, not everybody, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. He said, they are the sons of God. Most of us are led by public opinion. Most of us are led by our emotions. That's why we can't... See, a generation needs to wake up. How can you be a Christian for four months? You've not heard God. Every action you are taking, you are taking based on what you learned from a school. Every action you are taking, you are taking from what a friend suggested. And that's why we can't predict the outcomes of our lives. Not the fathers of old. From where they were living to what they did, they could tell you where they met God. They could tell you where God gave them the instruction. And this is why we don't have many sons. If you become a son, you can tell everything you are doing that it was God who commanded you to do it. And you will not move until God speak. It may be difficult, but if we, come, if we don't get to this level, let's forget territory. Because it will be like sending babies into the camp of the enemy. 
that the casualty will be enormous. You say, let's go and take over the demon that is did, is doing what he did. What some of the people you are carrying they fornicated last night. <laughs> they should be repenting. You are talking deep for you. <laughs> Tell you, are you joking? You now come back all of a sudden, some of them are dying, but they are pursuing them from work because you have aggravated the devil. Say, oh, so you are the ones who want to fight me in this territory. He will now show up the gates are porous because they are not sons. Are you saying? So we need sons. People who are led. You come to a point where you can tame your emotion. You are offended, but you don't react because God says, hold your, your peace. Ah, I wanted to move, but hold your peace. Even in your house, your wife speaks. You want to. You have one word that if you had spoken, it will take her five weeks to recover. One. That word is an arrow. It was already coming, but the Holy Ghost said, hold your peace. That's when you learn the technology of deep size. Mm. That hmm is the spirit. It's the spirit. It's a type of death, but it's for sons. I would have spoken, but the Holy Ghost said. Now, that hmm that you made is, is more important than somebody else's three hours prayer. Because another person can pray for three hours like a parrot, but he has not been able to come under the voice of God. So you who, who came under God's government, that hmm. when you now go to a territory and something is going wrong, maybe you stand there and then the same hmm is what the Holy Ghost will bring out of your spirit. This time when you say hmm, angels will be moved. Because that hmm is a mark of obedience. It's your mountain of encounter. It's your mountain of encounter. We went for a meeting somewhere. A man preached with fire. Everybody was there. They, they, they now told one elder to come and bless. The man just came and carried the microphone. And he said, mm. Mm. The third time the place erupted with power. Because many times he was commanded, Give all your money. He had his own projects. But God said, Give the money. When he gave it, all he did was. Mm. Many times they lie against you. You want to talk, God says. All you say is because it's the voice of God. You can't deny. So the only thing is the ventilation. A day we come, you now discover that hmm is a weapon. It's a weapon. When you enter a ter- <laughs> when you enter a territory, all you say is and God shows up. Somebody else who don't know that it's a product of how you have worked with God. We too, we too, we wear the same color of suit and say, hmm, people will say. As many as are led. If the Holy Ghost begins to lead you, your path will be narrow. Oh, you will not even, you won't have the liberty to be creative anymore. Because you will discover that it is a risk. After you have journeyed, it will tell you, I didn't lead you. If it happens twice, you now stop. Before you move, you ask him, Lord, what do you want? So you, you will not become, you will not be a creative man. You will be an obedient man. You will hear the voice of God. But if you hear God, you will be wiser than the most creative man. Because he is perfect in all his ways. He wants sons to rise. And those sons are the ones who can enter the armory of the spirit and bring out the weapons that can distort the operations of darkness. But we are few. Sons are few. Men who are led by the voice of God are few. And we talk sonship is not gender. It's rank. It's maturity in the spirit. How much of God can you mirror? To what extent do you follow the voice of Abba? Jesus said, my sheep heareth my voice. Hope you know they are lambs. Lambs don't know the voice of the shepherd. They follow the bleating of the sheep. It is the sheep that hear the voice. And they hear the voice so much that Anywhere the shepherd cries from, they can trace it. Because that is their direction. The sheep does not have direction. It's the voice of the shepherd that is the direction. So they don't have, they don't have the, they don't move about. It's only when the shepherd commands that they move. Those are sons. The third thing that defines a son is your capacity to endure the chastening of the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 to 8, he says, if we are not bastards, if we say we are sons, 
we must endure the chastening of the Lord. How many of us can endure the discipline of the Spirit? Somebody lies against you, the Holy Ghost say, you go and apologize. When you now check, you are older. Say, no, I won't. How can this little rascal talk and you say, I should, what, what is the meaning of it? He say, go do it. I'm trying to show him the heart of God. You now approach him. Say, okay. Um, 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 brother, that thing that happened the last time. He now look at you and say, please don't talk to me. Ah. <laughs> Coming to talk to you already is dead and you are still arrogant. You will say, he said, listen, listen, let me talk. Be very careful. You now look at him. If I make one phone call, this person is finished. But all those powers you have, God will cripple it. So that the next time you fly, it will be your wings. It's called the chastening of the Lord. It's sonship. Where God will narrow you. And see, when we talk territory taking, it's not just to pray in church for two days. Old. People must be raised. And when God succeeds in raising us, when we show up, ah, you will see individuals. See, our, our shape is in the spirit. Some of you here, you have horns. That horn, when you shake it, principalities fall. But the horn has not grown because you need fresh oil. He said, my horn has thou exalted like the horn of the unicorn. For you have anointed me with the fresh oil. But the fresh oil can't come until you go through the dealings of the Holy Ghost. And that's why that horn is not sharp. Some of us who are talking here, our, our walls are like spears, rods that can hack into the heart of, of darkness and plunder it. But that sword can't move. We can't wield it. Because you must become a son to be able to carry it. It's too heavy for your heart. And so God looks at you, your heart is narrow. And God can carry you through six months of dealings. He said, go to orphanages. The moment you collect your salary, you say, go to this orphanage. Some people are there, they don't have food. You say, no, I can't. It's the dealing of God. If you go home, you can't sleep. You roll this way, you roll that way, you roll that way. The moment you go to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, say, orphanage. Precious Lord, I love you, orphanage. You now stop praying for three days. You came to church. The moment they are worshiping, as you lift your hand, the person that started the song say, I'm an orphan. <laughs> you will lie down and say, I surrender. People won't understand what you are doing. When you now lie down, they will think, okay, you read it somewhere. No, you didn't read it. You are going through chastening. It's chastisement. That you're lying down is one month. That's one month which is lying down there. So when you stand up from there, you stand up like a warrior. They won't understand. But God is raising a son. God is raising a warrior. It's the chastening of the Lord. He will chase us so that all our bodies, all our elements becomes channels through which he can find expression. And when people like this rise, God becomes, like, becomes a warrior among us. Because when God speaks, a thousand people hear him. The psalmist said, once have the Lord spoken, twice have I heard. When God wants to do anything, there are people who are pliable in his hands. We become like spares that God wields. Because now there's no rebellion. Any direction God wants to move, there are people that they can wield. We have become like his battle axes. That's how territories are taken. Because the true warrior is God. But we are his weapons. But for us to function as his weapons, we must be able to mirror him. So that when we show up, they won't see us, they'll see our God. And when our God wants to function, he can wield us as different kinds of weapons. You know, those warriors that fight, some of them put knives in their shoes. For you to be a knife in the shoe, you must be chiseled to become tiny. There are some knives that are hung at the back. They are two different. This one is for throwing. So you will be light. God can throw you and you kill somebody in the distance. But this one, God will wait to. A warrior needs a lot of weapon. And that's why many people must be chiseled differently so that God can use them. It is called sonship. When these three things are achieved, then the fourth criteria of a son is the ability to be a government. That's self-denial. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. He said the government of this world shall be upon his shoulders. We cannot carry government on our shoulder except as we mirror him 
follow his leading and submit to his dealings. When we get to that point, truly we become sons. It's at this point that territory taking begins. And so when we come tomorrow, we'll begin with the weapons, the instruments for territorial takeover. Because this is what sons use. One of them is priesthood. When you become a son, prayer for you is a weapon. When you pray, system shake. Another one is prophecy. Prophecy. You hear God now so you can speak for God. I prophesied as I was commanded. If you can't hear, you can't prophesy. And that's why you must be a son first before you can take territories. The third is wisdom. He said, by me, kings reign. Princes decree justice. Nobles and all the rulers of the earth. If we change territories, we will come with an intelligence that they can't deny. The world is looking for answers to the crisis that they can't answer. And until the church and the house of God is set upon the mountains, the nations can't come. Because when they come, they are saying, teach us the way. Out of Zion proceeds the law. And so a people that have wisdom as weapons must rise among us. And you know, weapon in this, wisdom in this context is not eloquent or intelligent speech. It is ability to solve problems. And not just problems that originate from among men. Even problems that originate among spirits. Imagine the days of Daniel. The king showed up and said, I have a dream. Who can interpret it? People stood up as wise men. Let's try. He said, no. Tell me the dream first. <laughs> if I tell you the dream, you can tell me any lie in your heart. You, if you can interpret it, tell me the dream. Everybody step back and say, king, this thing you are asking, only those who dwell among the gods can do it. <laughs> so we are talking wisdom that solves unsolvable problems. But that was when Daniel showed up. And Daniel said, give us time. We know where dreams come from. We travel there. Give us time. And the Bible said, then was the dream revealed to Daniel in a vision. And when Daniel showed up, you imagine what the face of that king will look like. When Daniel told him, this is the dream you had. Any interpretation he gives is correct. The king submitted immediately. Pray for me. If you know this, then truly you are among the gods. That's what the word is. Imagine when Joseph showed up and interpreted the dream to the king. The dream said, in as much as God has shown you this thing, there's no one like you. He said, according to your word, shall the nations be ruled. If we will bring territorial shift and take over, we must come with a wisdom that they can't understand. We must come with dimensions they can't gain. Say, these are the kinds of things that sons remove from their quiver. And when you enter here, you will know that all the years that God took you through process was not a waste. A power comes upon you that you talk casually and territory shake because your walls have become prophets. Imagine a nation where women were eating their children. Now, the purest form of love among men is not with husband and wife. It's with mother and child. If, if you want to judge the love that exists among men, the purest is between mothers and children. Now, when mothers begin to eat their children, not that the case is really bad, but that was the situation. And they ran to Elisha. And he said, by this time tomorrow, he said, a cup of barley shall be sold for one shekel. The, the prime minister said, it can happen. Me too, I know God. Even if the window of heaven opens, this is not possible. But you see, the honor God gives to his servants is that when they speak, their words become law. And if you know these places in God, you will endure the process. That you can come somewhere that if you talk, the affliction of 30 years can stop in a moment. You can speak and gates can open over city. So sonship is a rank in the spirit. And if we know the excellency of sonship, we will pay the price to hear God. We will pay the price to go through his dealings and we will pay the price for God to shape us until we can mirror him. Because it will not be a disadvantage. Your words become prophecy. You have wisdom that dwells amongst the realms of God. And you function by priesthood that is higher than every darkness in your territory. 
This is what takes territories. We need priesthood. We need prophecies. We need wisdom. We need powers. And we need dimensions that are not among men. But only sons can be entrusted with those dimensions. When it has to do with territories, the powers are an entrustment. God don't throw it carelessly at anybody. If you are still ruled by your emotion, do you think God will give you power that if you say something happens? What if somebody offends you? You say your whole lineage, nobody will succeed. Because... <laughs> That's why God won't venture to give it to you until he knows that it's not your emotion that rule you, only him. So that even if you are angry before you talk, God can say stop and you will stop. So the powers to take territories are an, are an entrustment. And if we can't take territories, it means God doesn't trust us enough. You know, there are things you do by trusting God. It's called faith. But there are other things you do because God trusts you. It's called faithfulness. If we take territories, we need both faith and faithfulness. Otherwise, territories don't belong to us. Can we pray? The prayer tonight is simple. Today is introduction. It's just foundation. Because of where we want to go to. So when we are talking, we understand. But the prayer is simple. Lord, make me your battle axe. Make me your weapon of war you know when we're coming to this conference we thought we are going to start praying for manchester praying for liverpool the problem is not the geographical location the problem is us we have not yet been conquered if god conquers us <laughs> he can send one per territory one you know the bible says you are a city set upon a hill that means every individual here is a city so this number or how many cities are in the UK? Is it more than this number here? <laughs> I know this is one of the most civilized nations in the world, but I don't think there are more than 150 cities here. Imagine if every one of us here is a city. That means the people in this hall alone is enough for the UK. The Bible says Philip went to Samaria one man he took the whole city jonah went to nineveh one man took the whole city moses went to egypt one man too so the way god does it is one man per city but the problem is where are the men those who are conquered are few and so the prayer tonight is for the grace and the fortitude to submit until god conquers us so let it be written that we represent cities and generations can we pray father help me make me a battle axe make me a weapon of war this is not a loud prayer this is a prayer of commitment as you start praying it now god will show you the areas of resistance some of us is our ego as simple as that is some of us is our finances some of us is our relationships and as you pray that prayer, if God shows you what is the hindrance, submit it. Submit it. There's an assignment. Princes are at war. Men are lacking. And God will do everything to find men. After Jesus resurrected, he came back to earth. Forty days later, Peter went to fish. You are the one I handed over this assignment to. Is it fishing that you are giving your attention to? And Jesus asked me, lovest thou me more than this? Peter said, Lord, you know I do. So he had to be recolonized. What is that thing that is standing in the way? Because you may just be the deliverance that Manchester is waiting for. You may just be the deliverance that Liverpool is waiting for. You may just be the deliverance that Birmingham is waiting for. You may just be the deliverance that London is waiting for. Meanwhile, you are running in Manchester, running in London, running in Essex, hope looking for breakthrough. But you are the deliverance. But you have not yet been conquered. Raise us up, Lord, like the mighty men of Scripture, where one man can become the answer to a generation and the answer to a city.